Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses, and this video is going to be on Night Court by Manly P. Hall, an article taken from Horizon, February 1942, Volume 1, Number 6. All men get hungry at the same time, all need work, all need to dream, to plan not for conquest, but towards a common security. We expend our energies in effort to reform a derelict minority. Night Court Some people believe in the equality of men, and it is a marvelous idea but not exactly a workable idea for the reason that men are not equal. Nor is the supposed equality the simple problem, as Edwin Mark Ham states it, of men needing a chance. Many of our great industrialist and leading capitalists once sold newspapers and shined shoes, and we know it was no accident that their lives worked out differently than others. The quality in some individuals that forces accomplishment must be attributed to a deeply mysterious faculty, a certain impulse of will. The absence of it leads to a failure far more than greater or lesser degrees of school education, opportunities, and privileges. One requirement is the ability to think, something which, astonishingly, few people possess. It is probably correct to say that of the whole population of the world, a fraction of 1% think and the rest do not. The intellectual crust of mankind is a very thin layer on top. There are many reasons to deny men accomplishment. To make out of a human being an organic catastrophe, they may be traced to environment, to heredity, social disease, the social system under which we function, and they lie too in the many religious prejudices which have long contributed to human delinquency. A large part of humanity lives on the wrong side of the tracks and thinks on the wrong side of the tracks. Yet, few of these people are intrinsically bad. Mostly they are of one order or another of derelicts. These are conclusions I have come to after sitting on the bench with Judge Faulkner through several sessions of the night court. Any night is representative of a thousand nights. Perhaps you have not heard of gang roamers. They come before the bar in batches of six to a dozen. Most of them kids, few over 21, picked up for vagrancy. Under questioning by the judge, these simple statements emerge. When packed up, they were walking down the Santa Fe tracks. They were headed for Florida. Among all of them, there was not one cent of cash. None of them had families anywhere. They hadn't eaten in two days and then out of garbage cans. All they had been trying to do was get work. They didn't get any. So again, they were wondering. These young people were not arrested for criminal actions. They were taken in for a misdemeanor, the petty crime of not having any money in their pockets. And on the bench beside the judge, I was seeing the evidence of something long suspected, that the world's greatest crime is to be poor, for we have no way of making it impossible for youth to be poor. And surely it is no remedy that we clap our youngsters in jail and thus make criminals. Under our present system, says the judge, the problem has no solution. These kids come out of school without training in useful craft or trade, and as their clothes wear out and they are unsuccessful in their efforts to find work, they just wander along until finally arrested for vagrancy. The method of solving the problem is to take the boys to the city limits, tell them to keep moving, moving on to the next city, where they'll be invited to move on again. Or if the judge is kind-hearted, the best he can do is give them a five-day jail sentence with the remark, you can get five nights sleep, your clothes cleaned up, and a few square meals before you start out again. 
in the night court vagrancy is a relatively small problem. The last census showed only 485,000 persons who have a cent, who eat out of garbage pails, who have no work, no place to go. The night court's most recurrent problem is as you might expect, drunkardness. Something like 9 out of 10 petty criminals are drunkards. Some have made of drinking a fine art. One case was a man, 84 years old. His long white hair reached his shoulders. He had a little cross on a stick. He gave his address as Midnight Mission. He maintained he was in business. He cut lawns and preached the gospel. Was slowly working his way west. He had 26 cents in his pocket. He was sent on. There was no use doing anything else. Already he had 42 counts of drunkardness against him. An average night session brings before the judge from 40 to 65 cases of drunkardness. Every level of society is represented, but the emphasis is strong on down and outers. These indigent wanderers are a peculiar class of people. Some of them have been brought in for the same offense every few days over periods of 10 to 15 years. No sooner are they out of jail than they are in again. Punishment by law has absolutely no effect on them. Punishment to the end of time. They will keep on drinking. How to take care of them? The answer seems to be they should not be sold alcohol, which to most people suggests a return to prohibition. Although that noble experiment proved no stopper to undercover sales, with the unfortunate alcoholic getting drunk on canned heat instead of the refinery's less lethal spirits. Another baffling matter is the relationship of periodical drunkardness to longevity. Many of those habitually held before the court looked fine and fit in their 70s and 80s. Any effective approach to their problem must begin with determining the question, why do they drink? The basic reason to forget themselves, their drunkenness is an escape mechanism. They do not really enjoy being drunk. When sober, they find nothing to live for, and the alcoholic stimulation draws a veil over the dismally hopeless outlook of empty lives. Giving them the so-called cure only makes them more miserable afterwards for they are usually beyond the point of personal restraint to a debilitating habit. They do not care. So it is not the reformation of the individual that is here needed, but broad reforming of the social influences which by and large make it possible to crush an individual that life holds nothing hopeful for him. The habitual drunks are seldom vicious. They are contrasted strikingly by the gang type, which the night court has constantly to deal with. They, mostly young people and foreigners, are like a pack of human wolves, always on the lookout for a drunk to roll him and strip him of everything he has. They prowl around night after night, looking for anything at all of value they can get their hands on filling in dull periods by fighting and stabbing each other on the slightest provocation. Their concept of civilization is entirely outside any ethics with which we are acquainted. And what can be done for them? Our institutions are already so crowded that it is hardly possible to get in another delinquent. The unpleasant fact has to be faced that a certain percentage of our citizens are of a type that is fundamentally lawless. The percent is too large. The people can be called the victims of circumstances, but that avails nothing. For circumstances are made up of our social relationships and all the factors which make up modern conditions of living. When you get the story of the lawless character, probe for the contributing factor in the moral collapse, it invariably seems that this particular citizen would not have gone down had he strength of character. We are sure we have, for we are law-abiding, 
but how many of us have actually been tested? Would we have continued to be respectable if we had been faced with the same circumstances and conditions the lawless one has had to face? The conditions under which we live make it more profitable to be dishonest than honest. We act according to the degree of pressure brought against us, and if this is very great and we haven't courage or constructive impulse of will, if we are placed in situations we cannot face, then we become dishonest. Under such circumstances, a man steals a million and becomes a financier. Another steals a can of beans and becomes a thief. For the civilization which we have built rests in the theory of privilege resulting from wealth as the primary consideration of living. Money itself has become the very essence of our reason for being. Without it, we are a derelict. With it, we are reasonably safe from being picked up by a policeman. Civilization, its basis in the word civil, means the process of being civil to each other, which of course means considerate in actions. Money's main use is exploitation of others to the betterment and comfort of ourselves. The judge on the bench is forced by law to convict unfortunate people, knowing that in the same circumstances and without opportunity, he would have committed the same misdemeanor himself. The judge knows that he could solve a great many of these individuals' life problems in 15 minutes, but the law does not permit him to do that. He knows what's the matter with the law, and so do a great many other people. The one cure, and no one desires to advocate it, is a complete restatement of our entire system of economics. Who dares even to whisper that? It would mean being branded as a dangerous anarchist, and it would impose a great uneasiness of thought as to what might happen to you, yourself, if the system of money's dominance were changed and we could go back to the days when a man's house had a leather latch string instead of today's Yale lock and a chain bolt. Temptations have increased as opportunities have diminished. It used to be there was something for everyone to do, and unemployment was limited to those of subnormal mentality and the relatively few who simply would not work. If things slackened in one community, the workers migrated to another section. New territory under development was always the safety valve. When an individual no longer could sustain himself where he was, he moved. Now there is no place for him to move to. The boundaries have been all brought in. Money greed has depleted natural resources. Everything has been taken up, with title vested in the names of powerful individuals and gigantic corporate structures, and useful improvements in mechanism have proved to be the additional factor of technological substitution of mechanical power for manpower. We have to do something, and it would not be fascism. It will begin by our individual recognition that we have certain common responsibilities. It will begin by our individual recognition that we have certain common responsibilities, that we must secure the lives of people and on a corrected standard of values. The principle behind Christianity can solve the problem even if in practice it does not do it. We know that money should be used rightly, but this we do not do. We are afraid the dollar we give away will not come back. Having the privilege of great things, we put above them our own personal desires. The common error of today's civilization is that it is rooted in selfishness. Collective selfishness may be nationalism, but individual selfishness is a crime. The proper attitude for man is this. We are all one human family, hopelessly tied to a little ball, whirling through space, which is our earth. All men get hungry at the same times, all need work, all need to dream, to plan not for conquest, but towards a common security. All people could be happy as one great family, but instead they have isolated themselves into groups, large and small, 
each dominated by special conceits and motivated by special prejudices under which are to be sought special privileges. All are interested wholly in their own survival and each believes he is superior to the rest, a mathematical impossibility. Having lost sight of a common humanity, we have lost sight of the fact that regardless of which side of the tracks we live on, we can all be hungry and the need for shelter and clothing is a common need. We must discover that there is no civilization until it can take care of its own people. It is time to come out from under the hypnosis that economic supremacy gives security. The common good, which is the greatest idea of civilization, cannot be made workable or even possible by legislation. It will come when humanity is assured of rational effort in living the integrity of the individual. You can work it out in your own mind. You may not make it a law, but a way that you yourself will live. If enough people live that way, the good way, a marked change will come into our national life. A nation is made up of individuals and their attitude reveals the temper of the nation. We must move from an economic to an ethical foundation. And if the night court will have to continue to have its few who require special attention, 99 out of 100 people will have acquired and be guaranteed a reasonable security and a real right to happiness. The wrong way to go about this is to expend our energies in the effort to reform the derelict minority. Each one of us has the important job of setting our own lives straight. The real need of civilization is recognition of the necessity for reforming modern life as it is lived now by the majority in self-serving selfishness, condensed from a public lecture. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.